Welcome back to Nutritional Biochemistry at Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. In this video, we're going to go over the structures of amino acids, and not necessarily the um, organic nature of them, etc. We're going to go over just the groups of amino acids and talk about some of the basic functions, particularly as they relate to nutrition. And we're not going to go into heavy-duty details here, but eventually when we get into amino acid pathways, for degradation and synthesis, we'll talk more about uh, nutritional and other biological implications. And this is going to lead us into protein function and eventually enzyme function. So let's go over the basics of protein function. What are they used for? Well, first of all, and let me skip to this slide ahead of this, first uh, point on this slide basically sums it up. Proteins are linear, linear heteropolymers of alpha amino acids. So we'll talk about what the alpha means in just a second, but just as you would see beads on a string on a necklace, um, in a very similar way, proteins are strings of amino acids that have been polymerized together. Okay, And they can be very small or they can be very large, and we'll look at that in, in another video. But what are proteins used for? Well, their first function would be catalysis, and that's referring to enzymes. So as we know, hopefully from previous courses, enzymes catalyze reactions. And here are two examples, enolase, which is the ninth enzyme in glycolysis, and DNA polymerase, which is involved in DNA replication, cell division, etc. And so what these proteins do is they catalyze reactions that would normally be too slow without an enzyme to carry out life. Another thing that they do is they transport. Now we can talk about transport through just a simple watery medium, as in the blood, or we can talk about transport across a barrier, such as the plasma membrane. The first case where we transport through the blood would be hemoglobin. For example, hemoglobin is a protein that transports oxygen through the blood and takes it to our tissues so that they can have energy. Okay, Lactose permease, which uh, transports lactose, a disaccharide, which we have not talked about, across plasma membranes so that different cells can receive that lactose. And I will say that this transport protein, lactose permease, plays more of a role in bacteria, but it still satisfies the rule of transporting something. Okay. We also have a lot of proteins in structural components of the body. For example, connective tissue in our extracellular matrices. Um, collagen is a great example. Collagen gives bones tensile strength and prevents them from shattering. Um, collagen you can also find in your skin. Um, also, keratin is a major component of hair and nails in humans, so the integumentary system. And if we're looking at other organisms, for example, birds, there's keratin in the feathers, and say a rhinoceros, there is keratin in their horns. So structure. Another function would be motion. Okay, So for example, if we're talking about skeletal muscle, or cardiac muscle for that matter, and smooth muscle, while we're at it, there's proteins such as myosin and actin. For example, myosin is the major contractile protein, uses adenosine triphosphate to actually physically move and cause muscle contraction. And then it works in conjunction a lot of times with actin. And actin also has a function in cell motility. For example, if we're talking about cilia or movement of the cytoskeleton, actin plays a major role there and can produce motion of cells. Now, if we're just talking about proteins, uh, proteins are, involved, are composed of amino acids. There's strings of amino acids, and so, therefore, amino acids also play a role in this. But if we're just talking about amino acids individually, not as, a, as being polymerized into a protein, another function of amino acids, which we're going to hint at much later, is that they can be metabolized for energy production. Okay, so much like sugar and fat can be metabolized for energy, amino acids can be as well. All right, as I mentioned before, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. If proteins are the polymers, then amino acids are the monomers of those proteins. Okay? And when we say that proteins are linear heteropolymers, we mean that, first of all, proteins are not branched, um, branched amino acids. Okay? We're talking about a linear chain. Okay? 
and we'll look at some of those pictures in future PowerPoints. And heteropolymers means that all of the proteins are not just a single amino acid. For example, one amino acid is alanine. So a protein is not composed of all alanine. It's composed usually of most, if not all, of the 20 amino acids that we're going to see. Now, here is the general structure of an amino acid, right? So, the amino acids all have a central carbon labeled the alpha carbon. And on that alpha carbon, there are four groups. The first group is a carboxyl group, which happens to be deprotonated at physiological pH. And we hinted at that in the previous chapter on buffers and water. Another group on the alpha carbon is the amine. Now notice this amine is protonated, so rather than being an NH2 group, it's actually an NH3 plus at physiological pH. Another group is just a simple hydrogen. And then the last group is an R group. And this R group is different for all 20 amino acids. And since all of these three groups appear are the same for all of the amino acids, then the R group being different specifies the amino acid. And so you can tell which amino acid you're looking at based on the nature of this R group. This PowerPoint slide right here is more applicable if you've taken organic chemistry. If you've not, don't really worry about it so much. But one thing that you'll see in a lot of textbooks and lectures, and even if you go buy an amino acid supplement at the drugstore, is you'll see that they're all, at least in humans, L-amino acids. Um, what we say is that amino acids are chiral. Okay, what that means is that the central carbon right here has four different groups. Now the exception is glycine, which is achiral, but the exception is glycine, which does not have four different groups. It actually has an R group of a hydrogen, so it has two of the same group. But all other 19 amino acids have four different groups attached to this central alpha carbon. That makes these amino acids chiral. Okay, so for example, this is what we call the L enantiomer of alanine. Okay, now enantiomers really understanding what they are precisely is not really important here, but notice between L alanine and D alanine, if you were to put a mirror plane right here, this D alanine is the mirror image of this L alanine. Okay, so if you put a mirror right here, they are mirrors of each other, but they are not superimposable. So for example, if I were to take this D-alanine and simply translate it or drag it over here, and I put it on top of the L-alanine, it would not be exactly that, because the amine would be right here and the hydrogen would be over here. So what we say is enantiomers are non-superimposable mirror images. And it turns out that this is important in biological systems because, for example, in humans, which is what we're studying, all amino acids that we use, with one exception, um, which happens to be D-serine, but we'll talk about that much later, all amino acids that are in proteins, we'll say, are of the L-stereo chemistry. They are the L enantiomer. So if I was looking at asparagine, it's L-asparagine. We do not see D-asparagine. If I'm looking at L-glutamate, we only see the L-isomer. We do not see the D-isomer. Okay, The D isomers tend to be used a little bit in bacteria, but the bacteria even then still overwhelmingly utilize the L isomers. Okay, So we're only going to consider the L isomers in humans with the one exception that I said, which was D serine. Glycine does not have any stereoisomers because glycine is a chiral. Okay, and that mentions right here. The fourth substituent, the R group, is unique in glycine, the simplest amino acid. The fourth substituent for glycine is going to be a hydrogen, making it achiral, because it does not have four different groups. Another reason that understanding the difference between L and D is important in biochemistry is that not only do the proteins that we make only use the L isomers of all the amino acids, but when we're talking about interactions between those amino acids and other molecules, say a neurotransmitter on a receptor, the L isomers are important in recognition. So for example, if a ribosome is trying to synthesize a protein from amino acids, the ribosome would not be able to recognize D-alanine. It wouldn't recognize it. It would only recognize the L-alanine. So recognition is an important consequence of having only one 
isomer of these amino acids.